Hello and welcome to the COVID Corner. I'm your host, Cole the Science Dude. Most of you probably know me from TikTok where I post short educational videos, but today we're gonna to be going beyond 60 seconds as I talk to you about different methods for testing for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes the COVID-19 disease. Generally speaking, there are three types of SARS-CoV-2 tests. They are qPCR, or quantitative polymerase chain reaction, LAMP, or loop-mediated isothermal amplification, and antibody IgG-IgM testing. Now, I will not be covering antibody testing in this video because qPCR and LAMP will test whether or not you have the RNA for the virus currently in your body, aka are you infected currently and could you transmit that infection to another person? Whereas antibody tests don't test for the RNA of the virus directly, they test for the antibodies that your immune system would build in response to having been infected with the virus. So if you got infected and then you got better because your immune system fought off the virus and then you took another test, if you took another qPCR or a LAMP test, it would show up negative, whereas an antibody test would still be able to detect the antibodies in your system. TLDR, antibody tests can tell if you've had the virus, and qPCR and LAMP can tell if you have the virus now. Um, you will not get an antibody test, as generally speaking, they're pretty rare and only necessary in certain situations. So if you think you might have COVID and you drive to your local testing center, odds are you'll be getting either LAMP or qPCR, and that's why we're going to focus on them. Before I go into this too much, I think it's worth explaining the anatomy of the virus, because when you understand how it interacts with your host system, uh, you'll understand the testing process better. Now, if you look at the image on the left here, uh, this gray subsurface that we see is what's known as the protein envelope. Uh, that is essentially like the skin of the virus. It keeps the important stuff on the inside and everything else out. And attached to the outside of that are all these red spikes that you see on the image on the left or the yellow spikes in the image on the right. These are called spike glycoproteins. Now, spike glycoproteins are one of the more functional parts of the virus. Uh, they are comprised of several domains, but the most important of those domains is called the RBD, or the receptor binding domain. Uh, it is at the tip of it here, or, and you can also see it depicted in this image as the RBD there. Uh, and the purpose of the receptor binding domain is this is how the virus actually attaches to cells in your body. When somebody who is infected gives you the virus via aerosolized dr breath droplets that have the virus in them, what will happen is the virus will then enter your system and the receptor binding domain at the end of the spike glycoprotein will attach to what's called an ACE2 receptor. Uh, that stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. Now these are part of the renin angiotensin system in your body. It's basically a hormonal system that regulates things like your blood pressure, your systemic vascular resistance, uh, and your fluid and electrolyte balancing. The specific job of ACE2 receptors uh, is to basically take angiotensin 1, which is a chemical that will be present in your blood, and then chop that into angi angiotensin 2, which is a vasoconstrictor. So by constricting the blood vessels, it will actually boost the blood pressure. Um, and that is the basic method through how normally ACE2 receptors function. Uh, the problem is that the receptor binding domain at the end of the spike glycoprotein will bond onto these and then it will begin to inject material, its RNA material, which is uh, inside the envelope here. See that little coiled up pink thing? That is the RNA genomic sequence. That's basically the instructions that will be injected into the host cell that's gonna tell the host cell, how do you make more of this virus? We need to build more of these, and this is the part that facilitates the viral replication. Um, now it's important to note here, that when you're infected uh, and that whole process happens, the reason that there's such a wide array of symptoms for the coronavirus is mainly the fact that when this receptor binding domain attaches to these ACE2 receptors, you have ACE2 receptors all over your body. You have a high prevalency for them in your lungs, which is why pulmonary issues are so common with the virus and it's considered a respiratory infection, but you also have them in your brain, which is why neurological symptoms are very common. You have them in your stomach, which is why gastrointestinal system, symptoms can be pretty common. Uh, and overall, you have these ACE2 receptors all over your body. So the virus really can find pretty much anywhere to replicate and cause issues. Um, another thing to do with symptoms has to do with uh, cytokine and bradykine in storms, but we will not be talking about this in that video, though there is an interesting study that I will link in the comments down below. So first off, let's talk about the polymerase chain reaction tests, more commonly known as PCR. I'm going to go through describing a basic PCR for an RNA-only virus. Um, then I will describe the process through how we make that a quantitative polymerase chain reaction. Though first, a note. Um, 
the SARS-CoV-2 virus is what we call RNA only, meaning that the genetic information inside the virus uh, is RNA, not DNA, ribonucleic acid, not deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, I will show you this graph again later, but basically that means that it is single-stranded, not dual-stranded, and that it has uracil in place of thymine. Those are the only two differences, and we will cover them later. But the basic uh, materials necessary for a polymerase chain reaction test is four things. You need an enzyme called the TAC polymerase. You need a surplus of deoxynucleotide triphosphates, also known as DNTPs. You need a sample, which is the thing that's actually going to be amplified. And then you need targeting primers. And we're gonna go over what each of these do when we talk about how to run a normal PCR test. Step one is that you need to collect a sample. So this is what would happen if you went to Kaiser Permanente or your local testing center. You might be in your car or in a waiting room and they're gonna take this long nasal uh, swab and they're gonna stick it back deep into the nasal passage uh, in your head as you see in the diagram here. Now the reason that they're doing that is primarily because uh, the RNA, in, sorry, the virus has a high affinity for the mucous membranes in the nasal lining. And so they have a better chance of detecting it if you're only minorly uh, infectious, only if you've just gotten the virus, uh, they have better odds of picking it up in the sample. Then samples need to be pre-processed. So I mentioned earlier that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA-only virus. Some viruses, like for example, I believe AIDS, uh, begin as RNA, but they use DNA at some point during the replication process. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 does not. It is RNA through and through. So in order to work this test specifically on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we have to add a fifth material, and that is called reverse transcriptase. This is a man-made uh, enzyme that basically will zip along the strand of RNA, and it will build out a second strand to turn the RNA into DNA. It will replace ureth uracil with thymine uh, and basically prepare a, a DNA sample. Um, the PCR tests only work on dual-stranded DNA, not single-stranded RNA, which is why this step is necessary. So you've taken the sample, you have run it, you first need to isolate it so that you have removed all the mucus and other things and you've isolated just the RNA that would be present inside the, the virus. You then run that RNA through reverse transcriptase, which will build it into DNA. The next step in the process is that you're gonna take your patient sample, you're going to combine it with a master mix of chemicals that include the DNTPs and the TAC polymerase and the targeting primers and the fluorescent probe that we'll talk about at the end into a little bottle like this that will then get loaded into a machine called a thermocycler that you see here on the right. Now a note about thermocyclers. Thermocyclers are relatively expensive. Uh, cheap ones go for about $700 when they're shitty and homemade. Uh, lab grade ones can go for as low as 5,000 and really high end ones can actually go for north of 100,000. This is very expensive lab equipment and when you're trying to run a lot of tests, this is a huge uh, cost when you're trying to build up a lab from scratch. So that's one thing to note, these tests do get expensive to run. Now there are three basic steps that this thermocycler is going to take uh, the master mix and the DNA sample, and the sorry, the RNA sample through. The first step is called denaturation. Uh, this is gonna happen at 98 uh, degrees Celsius, and basically what's gonna happen is as the thermocycler heats up to this temperature, it is essentially going to melt the two strands of DNA apart. Now it's important to note that this is not the same thing as just RNA. You might be wondering why did we build it up, build it up if we're only gonna melt it apart. It is DNA, but we're taking the two ladders of the double helix pattern for the DNA and we are splitting them apart. Uh, then what's going to happen is the machine is going to uh, go into the annealing stage. So it's actually going to cool the sample down to 68 degrees Celsius, which is the bonding temperature of the targeting primers. Now I've been saying targeting primers, but really there are two types of primers, forward primers and reverse primers, and they work as such. Uh, when you look at this long strand of the RNA sequence, right, there's a lot of data in here, but it would actually be very dangerous if we were to replicate the entirety of the RNA for the virus because your sample would get even more contagious. You'd be growing the virus in a lab setting. There's huge contamination risks. Uh, you, you know, you risk the, the health and safety of your technicians even with proper PPE. It also wastes materials and it's unnecessary. So what we do is we section out a chunk of the RNA that's big enough to confirm that yes, this is in fact SARS-CoV-2, but small enough that we can replicate it quickly with efficient use of materials. And then when they find that chunk, that identification chunk, they're going to design a Ford primer that will list off all the DNTPs before that chunk and a reverse primer that will be a combination of all the complementary DNTPs at the end of that chunk. So you can see that better in the example here. 
Uh, this upper bit here is the forward primer, and this lower bit is the reverse primer. So basically, everything in between that is the sample that we want to copy. And then these primers are going to bond at the start and end, and they're what's going to tell the TAC polymerase where it needs to start copying and where it needs to stop copying. Once the annealing step has happened and the forward and reverse primers have bonded, you are then going to go into the elongation phase. Now these chemical structures that you see on the left, those are the deoxynucleotide triphosphates or the DNTPs. And essentially what is going to happen here is our boy TAC polymerase is going to begin at the forward primer and it's going to start zipping down the DNA strand one by one. And every time it gets to a new letter, it's going to know what the complementary uh, DNTP would be. It's going to pull that DNT DNTP out of solution and it's going to build it into a secondary strand as it zips along this line. So essentially what has happened is the two strands of the DNA have been melted apart and now the TAC polymerase is going along those sections that we want to copy and it's building up a second ladder from them. So from one strand of DNA we are going to end up with two identical copies thanks to TAC polymerase. And when that is all done you will have millions of copies because the cycle is going to repeat and repeat and repeat. This is the chain reaction portion of the, QP, of the PCR. And then now you've got millions of copies of this RNA. Well, how do you tell whether or not there was RNA there in the first place? Uh, if you're a lab technician, you have two options. Uh, the option that many people will learn in school is option one, which is running a gel. Uh, this is the basic method of taking a plastic casting tray. Then you're going to mix up some agarose or agar, as many people have uh, probably heard it in high school biology classes. You're going to pour that in and you're going to have this little mold thing that's going to sit there. Uh, not actually like it's a casting mold, not like mold, like a, a fungi. And then that is going to have some holes that are going to be solidified into the agar. The agar is then going to solidify and you're going to drop samples of your material after it's undergone this uh, reduplication process into there. You're then going to apply a voltage across the agar as you can see from the negative and positive lead here. And basically the biological substrate is going to be pulled through the agar and it's going to move towards the positive end of that electrical current. Uh, then you will begin a fluoresce stage where you can see them glow and you'll get an image like this. Then you compare the image of the pooled of the run gel or the pooled gel to what you would expect from the sample that you were looking for. However, as I'm sure you can tell, there are a lot of problems with this. First of all, it takes a while to prepare these, even if you're preparing them ahead of time. It takes a while to run the test and then, you know, comparing it to the control sample. There are a lot of variables that could go wrong. There's many things you can mess up. It's harder to teach a technician to do. It's prone to contamination. And even if you get a good result, it's not always like a one for one perfect match for the control. So it can be kind of hit or miss with regards to whether or not it's positive. So the solution for that is what's called a fluorescent probe. Uh, now fluorescent pro probes are very clever. They're put into the master mix as part of the, much like a primer or the TAC polymerase. And basically what happens is during the annealing stage, when the target uh, uh, forward and reverse primers bond onto the DNA sequence, uh, this fluorescent probe is also going to bond onto that DNA sequence. Now the fluorescent probe is comprised of two pieces. There's the reporter and there's the quencher. They're both going to bond to it and then during the extension phase, when TAC polymerase is zipping along that strand and building up the second half of the strand, it's going to cleave the reporter off from the quencher. Now, the reporter is specially designed to be fluorescent when cleaved. So as it gets cleaved, it'll prime its fluorescence, it'll begin to glow, and then it'll dissipate into solution. That means that the more and more this gets copied, the more you have these fluorescent primed reporters in solution, which, begins, which means that the sample, if there is RNA copying going on, will begin to glow like the image on the right in the middle here. And that's what a positive test would look like. Um, so there's a couple of problems with PCR tests. Uh, first of all, that fluorescent primer that I taught, or that fluorescent probe that I talked about is exceedingly expensive because they're hard to manufacture. And even though you only have a couple of uh, primers, that fluorescent probe really drives the cost up. Also, they take a lot longer. They're very manually intensive. Many technicians jokingly refer to PCR as pipette, cry, repeat, because it takes a lot of work to pre-process the sample. And they're very expensive because they also require equipment like a thermocycler, which is something that's hard to build from scratch and have work accurately. And they're expensive when you buy them from laboratory firms. So there's many issues with qPCR, even though it is a basic test, probably in all likelihood, if you've gotten tested for COVID, you've gotten a PCR. But there is a better way, and the better way is LAMP.
also known as loop mediated isothermal amplification. Now, lamp testing is very complicated, but overall the idea is the same as qPCR. Uh, you're essentially taking a chunk of RNA that you can identify as being, yes, it is SARS-CoV-2. You are then multiplying it many, many times. But the difference here is that rather than creating many millions of copies, loop, the loop part of lamp, uh, is going to create this one really, really long loop of all of this sequence that's been copied over and over and over again. And it's got not, instead of millions of copies, it's one really, really long copy that repeats. Um, now, the, the actual chemical process through how LAMP works is exceedingly complicated, and explaining it in the same depth that I explained qPCR would legitimately add probably 40 minutes to this video, and I'm not going to be able to fully do it justice, so I'm not going to go into the, the, the nitty-gritty of how this works, but I am going to explain some of the benefits of it. Um, so, first of all, because, note the word isothermal there, loop-mediated isothermal amplification. Isothermal means happening at one temperature, which means with a lamp test, you don't need a thermocycler, which is always nice when you can eliminate a $5,000 to $100,000 of a piece of equipment. That dramatically drops the cost of entry, uh, the cost of barrier to entry to be able to run these tests. Overall, it's generally speaking a pretty good thing. Uh, also, there is no pre-processing needed. Now, this is kind of a, a, a double-edged sword here. Technically speaking, lamp tests are significantly less prone to contamination, and therefore you can run the samples raw, meaning unlike a qPCR, where they'd have to take a mucus sample and then they'd, they'd have to isolate the RNA from the mucus, with a lamp test, they're actually going to, they don't have to do that. They could run the sample raw with the mucus and then just let the lamp process take over. However, that significantly reduces the sensitivity of the lamp test. So company, there's a company here in, in California called Color that's been de designing these lamp tests and trying to ship them out to people. Uh, and those tests operate uh, using a, a uh, pre-processed sample where you've isolated the RNA out of the sample because it improves the sensitivity of them and it makes it more likely that you'll catch somebody who is actually uh, positive for the virus rather than giving them a false negative because they didn't have high numbers of the virus in their sample. Um, and lastly, and this is the best part, the identification of positive tests is significantly easier because you don't need to run a gel, you don't need to have expensive fluorescent probes in there. The chemical process of loop, when it's doing that DNA replication, throws off a shitload of hydrogen ions, which dramatically drops the pH of the solution that is being replicated. That means that if you add a simple pH indicator, like for example phenol red, the chemical pictured here on the right, you get a very visible color change here being performed in the test. If you look at the rightmost panel here, when it's negative, it is this red-pink color, and when it's positive, it is this yellow color. This is significantly easier uh, for a lot of reasons. Here's the rundown of the list of the main benefits of LAMP. First of all, it is significantly cheaper. Even though it uses six primers instead of two, it doesn't have to have the fluorescent probe, which means overall LAMP tests are significantly cheaper to run. It is also significantly faster. Typically speaking, a competent technician can get accurate results back from a LAMP test in under 30 minutes if they know what they're doing. Also, it is easier to identify. You don't need a fluorescent rig to tell which of them is glowing. You don't need to run gels and risk all of the problems that could come along with that. It doesn't require expensive lab equipment like, uh, you know, the, the thermocyclers. And if you really had to, you don't technically have to pre-process the sample. So, all said and done, PCR is uh, what the majority of the testing stockpile in America was, which is why the majority of places that are doing COVID testing now run PCRs. However, LAMP tests have a lot of benefits to them, and that is why companies like Color and others are working on developing effective cost, uh, you know, cost low kits to be able to ship out to people. I think over time, we will probably see testing centers switching to LAMP as opposed to PCR, uh, but... That is basically COVID testing in a nutshell. If you would like significantly more information on this topic, I highly recommend a much more in-depth video by a channel called Thought Implorium. I will link that in the channel description, or sorry, in the comments down below, uh, or in the description of the video down below, rather. Uh, his video covers some of this information, but he goes significantly more in-depth, as well as showing you actually how uh, the, these tests are run by running them on camera himself. Uh, and that is a very good video if you'd like more information. But overall, hopefully, now you have a better understanding of what exactly is going on when you go in for your COVID test. So I hope I didn't lose you. I hope the description was good. Please let me know if there's anything you thought I could have done better or differently. And have a wonderful day.